Welcome back to another episode of Let's Face the Facts. I'm your host. I'm David Almeida. I'm an actor in Orlando, Florida. And every week I sit down with an actor or artist friend. We watch an episode of The Facts of Life. And then I hit record. We talk about the show. We talk about my guest. We talk about anything and everything else that we might be able to think of. And hopefully we have some fun along the way. This week, my guest is Steve Pernick. I have introduced so many people as funny guy. Steve is a funny guy. That is that is such an understatement. Steve Pernick is someone who defies description. Okay, imagine a sitcom. That typical sitcom trope of the funny character who is always off to the side. Not one of the lead characters, but the funny supporting character that steals the show. Steve is that person, always seemingly off in the corner, somewhere on the outskirts, in just the periphery of your vision, who will throw out a zinger, a pun, a joke, and it just, it is astounding the way his brain works and how he is always in make the funny mode. And I, I think you get a good uh, sample dosage of that in this episode as, uh, as you listen along. Uh, Steve and I watched season three, episode eight. It was called From Russia with Love. Uh, its original air date was December 16th, 1981. And uh, this was an episode I specifically asked Steve to do. And uh, you will learn why very soon if you haven't already figured it out. I think we're ready to jump on in, kids. Let's face the facts with Steve Pernick. Well, here he is, ladies and gentlemen. The wonderful, the fabulous, the hilarious, <laughs> waving to the microphone, Steve Pernick. Yeah, isn't that how radio works or whatever this is? Um, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> whatever this is. It's Less Fates of the Facts, the podcast that reveals all. Yeah. In the Facts a, of Life universe. It's a, it's a deep ass dive, let me tell you. Well, I was alive in the 80s, which is good. And uh, that's a good thing. Yeah. We, um, he and I just watched, before we like get into the meat of the show, we just watched From Russia with Love. Yes. And is that is that like a title of a movie, like a James Bond? Yeah, it's a title of a James Bond book and movie. Oh, yeah. I, I can't believe I knew that. Yes, that's absolutely true. It's a, I'm deeply shocked. From Russia with Love. This is a very different From Russia with Love. This is, yeah. We don't have a James Bond. There's yes. no gadgets or killing people. There's no... There's no Sexy gypsies catfighting over it. that's that's the best part of From Russia with Love. Is it? I've never oh, obviously yeah. I've never seen it. I yeah. couldn't even I didn't even know I knew what it was. Yeah, and Robert Shaw is a it's a crew cutted blonde assassin. Oh yeah, for the Russians. I, James the James Bonds never. I, I like the newer ones. The newer ones with uh, Daniel Craig. Uh, yeah. I'm like okay because they have a much more modern spin to them. But you're not they, a Connery guy, huh? Um, I mean I, I'm not in anything. I don't I didn't really yeah. care for any of them. All right. I don't they they don't really grab me. Well, there you go. So clearly, as we discuss this from Russia with Love, yes, <laughs> we can see I'm a much more of an expert on the other from Russia with Love. <laughs> this one, this one is all new to me. Yeah, as the as the uh, show wound down, yeah, uh, you gave your review in two words. Do you remember what you said? No, what did I moments say? ago. You just went so corny. Yeah, Facts of Life is corny. Yeah, it's a very corny program. Um, it was of its time. Yeah, we will certainly give it that. But um, but even so, I, I think all. <laughs> Time or not time, even in the 50s and 60s, in every decade, there's always been like really smart, witty sitcoms that would get all of the Emmys and things. Gilligan's and Island? The, no, not Gilligan's Island. No, that was not that's a not smart you... and witty sitcom. <laughs> and then there would be sort of the populist ones. Yeah. That would that was sort of, the, aw shucks, and you feel good. and, and Yeah. And, but there, there's not necessarily... Uh, it doesn't challenge you intellectually. No. Let's put it that way. Yeah, this, you have your all in the is, family on this side, but your happy days and your Laverne and Shirley over on the other side. Right. There's nothing wrong with it. It's it's like yeah, it's, uh, it's, TV Prozac, really, yeah, or a little bit yeah. of junk food, a little bit of yeah, yeah. That's cool. No, I, I I do not disagree. So before we start getting into synopsizing the show, two things I always like to ask my guests. Number one is 
you already alluded to it saying you were alive in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Do you have a relationship with this show as in did you watch it first run? Or uh, no, run? I was certainly aware of it. I, I knew the characters. I knew mm-hmm. this, Mrs. Garrett and Duty and Natalie and, and Joe and mm-hmm. Blair. Yeah. I could have named all the characters walking in yep. mm-hmm. and kind of faked some of the theme song and whatever. I know that George Clooney was on it for a hot minute as a semi-regular. I know that Molly Ringwald was on the first season, so I kind of know the, okay, the catch you know, stuff. You know more than some others who have sat yeah. here. Um, but I cannot say that I was ever... Uh, if, it wasn't destination television for Yeah, me. You weren't a devoted fan. You were a yeah. peripheral. Oh, yeah. Now, before we get into the synopsis of the show, um, I would like to ask you if you could give us a just one or two sentence compressed synopsis like you might see in a TV guide listing when you see The Facts of Life, 9 p.m. Wednesday night from Russia with Love. Um, Natalie's plans for a romantic getaway are thwarted when Grandma comes to town. That is perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. And no spoilers. Yeah. I mean, because I don't think that's a spoiler. Even the TV ads had to have the grandmother in them. Yeah. That was it. That was beautifully done, oh, sir. Oh, I thank you very should, much. You should do improv or yeah. something, Steve. <laughs> or, 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 yeah. <laughs> or you should write for TV Guide. Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh. No. Oh. Wah, wah. It's still out there. Just who, who the fuck buys who, it? Wah, wah, who, why? Exactly. Who would ever read TV you Guide? See? And it's 8 and a half, 11. Like, it's, it's full size. It looks like, you know, people are time. It's on the newsstand. And you're like... At one point, the greatest periodical in the United States. Never missed an issue. And, oh, my God. And now nobody. Yep. Well, um, this, this is times changing. Yep. So, 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 so true. So I'm really not here as any kind of Facts of Life fan. I think because Natalie was a Jewish girl and this is her Jewish grandmother. Yes. I'm here as your choke, token Jew friend. Oh, no. I think that's what it is. I think I'm, I'm here for my hebitude. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, well, let's address this right here. Here's a funny little story. When we did the um, attempt to do a backdoor pilot called... Brian and Sylvia, at the end of the second season, they tried to create another show of Tootie's aunt, an African-American woman, Mm -hmm. and her husband, played by Richard Dean Anderson. Oh, MacGyver. Pre-MacGyver. Wow. So it was supposed to be a show about a young couple who was interracial in 1980. So it was going to be kind of revolutionary for It's a little boundary pushing. Yeah. It was not very well written, though. Uh, and Cameron Francis went through it with me, and uh, word got back to Trinell about what an awful, horrific piece of shit we had just watched with terrible racial humor. And Trinell went to me and said, why didn't you ask me to do it? I well, would have enjoyed that. You could have had uh, a, 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 a white gentleman and a, and a black female yeah. to and watch the white gentleman and the black we, female. We could have, but I said to her for the same thing. I said, I thought of asking you, but I didn't know how to do it without you making you as my friend feel like a token and yeah. saying, hey, as a black show, let me bring in the black friend. Um, can, I, can I say that word? Is it, is it okay? Is the friend? B word? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you could say friend. Uh, so <laughs> Trinell beautifully and so elegantly just said, no, ask me. I don't care. That's mm-hmm. fine. I'll be your token. That's cool. Yeah. So uh, for future, I do know I can ask Trinell. So I thought, okay, I'm not going to make the same mistake with you. I told you what the episode was. Yeah. I said, if I am, am offending you, tell not me to the fuck least. off. Not the, yeah, the grandmother is played by Molly Pecan, who was uh, in the Yiddish theater in New York for years and years. It was a little fire plug of a gray-haired woman who reminds me very, very much of my own maternal really? grandmother, who spoke with a, a very thick uh, Russian-Jewish accent as well. Is, um, that your, is that your origins as Russia? Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, three of my four grandparents were born there. Mm-hmm. Only one was born uh, here in this country, and she was the very first of her family. All wow. of her older siblings were were born in, in Russia, too. Oh, and they came over. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, and that was grandparents. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, cool. my gra- now, grandparents. Now, um, I'm curious. I think I understand a little bit about what Yiddish is. Mm-hmm. But help me to understand. Yiddish is not technically a language connected to a place. Well, no, it, it well, it's not because it's, a, it's more of a cultural because the Eastern European amalgam. Jew didn't necessarily have a place. There are certain cultures that exist or existed at least without mm-hmm. a homeland. You think of the Gypsies that they call the Roma now. Mm-hmm. Um, um, certainly the Jews. Um, 
uh, Armenians, uh, uh, largely oh. there's, even though there is an Armenia, yeah. there is a very large Armenian population in so many other okay. countries and sense. whatever. Yeah. So uh, there's certainly one. And so, um, yeah, there, 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 there are these certain cultures that just sort of exist without a home. And um, and so that makes the language an, an amalgam of other types uh, yeah. of languages, right? Uh, and, and right. And with uh, Yiddish, it is largely German and Hebrew mm-hmm. with some Russian and some other ancillary okay. Slavic stuff coming into it. Cool. Well, are we ready to jump on into this? Yeah, let's face the facts. <laughs> oh, he said the title. <laughs> Wait, where's the duck that drops out of the ceiling? You see, I love when we work together because I can make a reference like that. And I certainly understand and it. And <laughs> you're beautiful. <laughs> but I, most people I say that too, and I, other than like, you know, Wesley Slade, everyone else would just look at me blank, like cricket, cricket. Yeah. It's like you don't, but that's... He that's was a, referencing the 1950s game show, You Bet Your Life, hosted by Croucho Marx. Thank you. That's Subtitle. Me, the human footnote. <laughs> Subtitle Steve voice. <laughs> <laughs> so our episode begins with... Um, Natalie putting on some nail polish Ooh. and she's showing it off. And, um, I do notice in the cafeteria on the background, the windows, they do have snow, like spray snow and you can't really see through them. So they're like trying to, so this is, must be some kind of Christmas break. The girls are getting ready to go on a ski trip. Right. Cause this show is broadcasting in December. So uh-huh. we're preparing for it. Now it seemed to me like they were getting ready to leave like that day like they had they had suitcases packed right and And then that sort of doesn't happen (laughs) no it's it's very weird we'll we'll get to that when we get to that but um at the moment i will say in the the watching of the show it is like oh okay so they're getting ready to take a trip and they're like leaving now to go to the train station or the airport or whatever hit the slopes yeah hit the slopes blair comes in As they often try to make Blair seem snooty or hoity-toity, they frequently give her French references. I think they're mirroring Miss Piggy. I don't know quite where. That was the 1980s hoity-toity go-to? I mean, mean, it was in the 30s when Cole Porter was writing. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not so sure there was any huge cultural... I don't remember a big French cultural influence. You know, freak out, le freak c'est chic. Freak out, that was... And was that voulez-vous coucher avec moi ce soir? That was that was in the seventies, I think. That You're was, right. That, that was the seventies. That. that was Lavelle. Yeah, I don't feel like there was any um, especially greater French influence on our culture at this point in the early eighties than there was before. So it's Blair speaking French is always to me a kind of a, a simple crutch for the middle-aged vaudevillian writers that we often reference. Um, so what we gather is that Bird Sugarman. <laughs> Bert Sugarman. They all have names like Bert Sugarman, <laughs> Al Waxman. Who is, who was the head writer on the first like first couple of three seasons of Cal Burnett? It was like, it was like Ira Grossberg. It yeah. was like it, right. Jewy McJuzalot. Yes, it yes. was really. I, <laughs> I tried to come up with the Jewish and Jewiest name that I could. <laughs> okay, and lay it on me. Hebe Kikenstein. <laughs> <laughs> was, that was the Jewish, Jewish name I could come up with. And then I, I told it to my writing partner at the time, Richard Dottero, and Richard said, I think I got you beat. Mezuzah, I love money knows. <laughs> um, oh and God. so I, I walked away with the silver. <laughs> this, this is my son. Mezuzah, I love money knows. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh, I, oh, oh my god! I, I have. I need a minute to recover. Um, well, this particular episode doesn't really hit Jewish stereotypes at all. I don't um, think in any big ways. It, it, I mean, yeah, passive aggressive, nudgy grandma. But yeah, yeah I'm, I, mean, I guess they're Jewy as hell. They are. <laughs> Certainly, a uh, uh, Mindy Cohen is Jewy as hell, and uh... um, <laughs> but with Natalie, we do often get things about her talking about her mother, saying like, "My mother wouldn't believe it." So if when I get home, my mother's going to be nagging. We we get a lot of implications without it overtly saying that Natalie's Jewish mother, mother, Jewish mother, Jewish mother. Yeah. So now we're getting the grandma, we, mm. and we don't know whose parent this grandmother is. We're not sure if it's uh, maternal or. Paternal, right? They don't say grandmother. But uh, before grandmother arrives, though, what is happening is Blair is showing off her new skiing outfit. 
And so is Tootie. And expositionally, we get the wonderful, gee, Natalie, I really wish you would come skiing with us. And Natalie is like, nope, I'm going to be spending time in New York with my family. Mm-hmm. And then Tootie says, oh, by the way, and Tootie, who's typically the busybody, the, no, the nosy one, Tootie says, oh, by the way, a postcard came in from your parents. They said they're having a lovely time in Hawaii, et cetera, et cetera. And she babbles on about other stuff. Do you still want to read it? She read the whole postcard. Oh, Tootie. What are you up to? <laughs> but what that reveals is Natalie's parents are in Hawaii. So I thought you said you were going to go home and stay with your parents, Natalie. Okay. Maybe there was a little bit of deception. Now, here's the thing. In an earlier episode, Natalie spent a lot of money on some makeup kit that Blair was selling. Countess Calais Cosmetics. And the figurehead was Zsa, Zsa Gabor, who was a guest on that episode. Oh, boy. Yeah. And you want the facts of life plus Zsa Zsa Gabor equals heaven. Um, (laughs) So um, (laughs) what what happened was Natalie lied to her mother about needing money for some type of a field trip. So she was on the payphone and she's like, Mom, I need this money. Yeah, it's... The payphone. The payphone. We're going to comment. We're going to talk about that. But Natalie says, Mom, of course, would I lie to you? Like, for... We, we're we having some ethics issues with... I didn't remember this when I used to watch it years ago. We have another one here where Nat, Natalie is being a duplicitous, lying... She's a 15-year-old girl. Yeah. A boy crazy girl. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And I believe there is definitely a lot of parental deception things that happen at that age. Um. Yeah, clearly. Natalie is going to be going up to New York... But to her parents' place where they are not because she has a date with Chip Douglas, a boy from Bates. She's entertaining a gentleman caller. <laughs> <laughs> Going to show her her book of etchings. Mm-hmm. Show him her book of etchings. Um, they do allude to the fact that, oh, he's that boy from Bates. He's so cute. They talk about how he's the one that wears glasses. And then someone else makes a later comment about, well, as long as you serve him something, it doesn't get caught in his braces. Right. They're, they're painting a lovely picture here. <laughs> now, it, uh, it, was he made up out of whole cloth just for this episode? You go deep on this. Has there ever been this Chip fellow before? Nope. No, Chip okay. Douglas does not. He's one of many, many boys. They just... Chip Douglas, by the way, is um, a character on My Three Sons. Is he? Yes, absolutely. I, I, that, that exact name, Chip Douglas. Oh, no. Chip, Robbie, and Ernie are the three sons in the color version. There was an older brother that I guess was gone, but and he was in the very early episodes in black and white. Wow. Yeah. Chip See, Douglas. I never watched my three sons, so that was that was a little before my time. I like wonder that. if it was a little reference and a little Easter egg there for those who paid attention. Oh, well, happy Easter, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Steve. I'm older than you, David. <laughs> And what better thing to give your Jewish friend than an Easter egg? (laughs) But what's happening is, the story is, Natalie has told the school or the people at school, she's alluded to the fact that her parents are home and she's going to be spending the time with them. Now, her grandmother had apparently contacted her and said, well, uh, are you going to come home for whatever this break weekend is? And she does say, two days. How can I deny my parents two days with me. Mm-hmm. And then later they're like, you ain't going home to your parents. But two days. We're talking, this, is, this isn't even a long weekend. Yeah. I don't know what we're preparing for here. Just a couple of nights. Yeah. So very weird. And um, so with the, and so Natalie has told her grandparents that she is staying at school to study. So school thinks she's going to be in New York. Grandparents in New York think she's going to be in school. Um, at one point, someone even says, wow, Natalie, you've told an awful lot of lies to people. And she just kind of shrugs and says, survival. Survival. Doesn't she say that? Something to that effect. Yeah. It's yeah. called surviving or it's called survival. Yeah. It's, it's quite a deception here. And, uh, fortunately this is a sitcom and she completely gets away with it and it's over in seven minutes. <laughs> nope. I am just kidding. Then there is a brief point where the kids all... The girls all talk about their grandparents. And there's a general consensus of, oh, yeah, spending time in the city with your grandparents. Yeah, they, you know, they're old. They do old people things. It's just kind of general ageist things. Except for Joe, who feels a little cheated because she never got to meet her grandparents. They died on her. Correct. Thank you for saying that because I forgot that. And that that comes into play later. Um, I do have to point out something. 
Tootie says all her grandparents do is pine for the good old days. <laughs> um, okay, African American. It's 1981. <laughs> what were the good we'll, old days? We'll, we'll give you. No. We'll give you. Tooties. Remember all the neat places we couldn't sit. I know the drinking fountains <laughs> we couldn't go to. Remember the, those fun times. Remember the, the, Remember those those neat fire hoses. <laughs> the pools we couldn't <laughs> swim in. Oh lord. And yeah, I, I, I. Wow. I'm. I just. I'm not saying it's not possible. Yeah. There were certainly. Affluent. Well, maybe like they, they didn't deal with Natalie's fatness. They didn't really deal with Tootie's blackness in uh, certain ways. It was like, yes, grandparents, when you age, you often do pine for the good old days and everybody lives in nostalgia. But uh, yeah, it's weird to assign that one to the African-American character. I think you're looking for way too much in an episode <laughs> of Facts of Life. I mean, all they're trying to do is set up some stupid premise where somebody does something wrong and learns a lesson. <clears throat> Nobody's really looking at the timeline of even what this weekend is. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> never mind. You're so her, right. Her, her, her parentage. Oh, it's an it's an exercise in insanity and futility. And I've already that. Sadly, Steve, that train's already left the station. Ooh. Here we are. When the girls are asking what Natalie's plans are, is that Chip Douglas, who is at Bates? Bates is a mile away. Why she's meet? Why they have to go to New York to meet? We're about. We're in Peekskill. We're an hour outside of New York. So why they have to? I mean, it's to get him alone. But yeah. they're like, so what are y'all? What are you gonna do? Maybe he's already gonna be in New York for the weekend. Maybe that's where his family lives. I, I guess we've yeah. So. She's like saying, well, I'm going to have him over. And I think, I don't know exactly what she starts to talk about. As she starts to talk about what she thinks is going to happen. Mrs. Garrett bursts in. Natalie, your suitcase is upstairs and I brought it down. You are invited to do your bad Charlotte Ray impression. No, I, as I, I, I can skip that one. That's all right. I, it, it, okay, you going to leave me out here yeah, alone? It's just you. Just Okay, because I do a really good bad Charlotte Ray impression, as you can tell. Uh-huh. Um, so I invite you, if you are so inspired, please, please do join me. And Mrs. Garrett is wondering why Natalie's suitcase is so heavy. And it somehow flies open like suitcases do. Upside down, by the way, which <laughs> I don't think they planned. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Prop fail. Uh-oh. And my cookbooks. Natalie, you hate cooking. And Natalie no, tells No, I love that. cooking. But that's, how they, they, that's I think, a, a, a very large attempt to keep it away from the sexual. This is going to... I'm making a meal for this fellow. Yeah. They're, they're focusing on the yeah. eating rather than being alone in an apartment with an adolescent boy. Yeah. Because it would be it would be many years before Natalie loses her virginity on the show. Not on the show. Oh, wow. On the show. I got to see that. That's a, <laughs> that's a different show. <laughs> uh, so... Um, no sooner does Natalie start spinning some more lies... Then outside in the hallway, we hear, yoo yoo And in comes the amazing Molly Picon. Mm-hmm. And um, she is grandma. Grandma has decided, you know what? I couldn't bear to think of Natalie stuck at school studying. So she made, she says, I made you some, I brought you a package and I was going to mail it. But then I thought, why should I? This is, I'm, I'm slipping into a Jewish it's a, but, but she has a thick uh, European Jewish accent. So go yeah. ahead and do it. I don't care. It's not going to offend yeah. me. But, um, but she's like, but I had it and I was going to take it to send it to you to the post office. But then I thought my car is already pointed north and I'm more reliable than the U.S. Postal Service. Yeah. So, so she shows up because poor Natalie, you're stuck here for the weekend. I'm going to come and I'm going right. to visit you. And... Uh, it ruins Natalie's lie that's, of getting away. Uh-oh. That sh- that's lying, biting you in the ass. Now, Molly Picon has a very, very, very thick Jewish accent, and she was from the Yiddish theater. Yeah. However, they never really say the word Jewish in the entire episode. They talk about her Russian ethnicity and, mm. uh, and later on uh, 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 the Cossacks and all that kind of stuff, yeah. the Bolsheviks. But they never really say Jewish. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. Huh. I guess so. Did you notice that? It, it didn't, not to, now that you pointed out to me. Yeah. And even the episode is called From Russia with Love. It's, it's focused on the, the Russian immigrant, but not, not necessarily from, the Jewish immigrant. Not from Jewtopia Correct. with love, as yeah. it probably should have been. Yeah. My people were, were Russian Jewish immigrants. They were the, the Fiddler on the Roof Jews, the Shtetl Jews. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and it seems that's like exactly what she's supposed to be, but without ever saying the name of the religion. Yeah. You're right. It never is explicitly it's never stated. Explicitly stated. Huh. Well, what we end up happening is Mrs. Garrett offers her uh, some 
uh, tea or coffee. And she says, I'll take warm water with lemon. So Mrs. Garrett's like, good. Natalie, help me in the kitchen. Uh Uh-oh. And so now we know Natalie's going to get what for from Mrs. Garrett. Because she got busted. Yeah. Oh, nice. Nice little Tootie reference. Um, So she's like, you start talking. So while they're in the kitchen preparing this, boiling the water, and they actually do pull some lemons out of the fridge. There are many episodes that there's no food, even though they're supposed to be cooking and preparing meals for a whole school. Yeah. Wow. If you're impressed by the presence of a lemon, they really must fail on that (laughs) pretty big time. (laughs) Set the bar very low. Um, So Natalie fesses up and it's like, well, you know, why don't you want to spend time with your grandmother? And Natalie just kind of has that. She's it's and they're not that overt about she's old and old is icky. But there is a sense of she she's just annoying and she's we don't connect and. That type of stuff. Yeah. Then we come out to back to the dining room and the tin that, uh, uh, by the way, the mother, the, the grandmother's name is Mona. Uh-huh. And uh, the tin that Mona brought is open and she is sharing piroshkis with the girls. Is that, am I saying that right? I, I Not really a word I know. Really? Piroshkis. Yeah. I don't know from piroshkis. Maybe, are you going? He's going to the internet, folks. I'm going to the internet, folks. Um, well, this just in. I mean, it sounds like pierogies, which is Polish. Um, uh, but I don't really know the term piroshki. Go to wiki piroshki. P-I-R-O-Z-H-K-I, uh, which is Russian. Uh, piroshki are a Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian. Is that how you pronounce uh-huh. that? Sure. Puff pastry, which consists of individual sized baked or fried buns stuffed with a variety of fillings. The stress in piroshki is properly placed on the last syllable. So they're saying it wrong, piroshki. A common variety of piroshki are baked stuffed buns made from yeast dough and often glazed with egg to produce the common golden color. They commonly contain meat, typically beef, or a vegetable filling, mashed potatoes, mushrooms, onions, and egg, or cabbage. Piroshki could also be stuffed with fish, like salmon, or with an oatmeal filling mixed with meat or giblets. Sweet-based fillings could include stewed or fresh fruit, apples, cherries, apricots, chopped lemon. Okay, that's probably what we're talking about. We're talking probably about a desserty, A desserty version? Thing. I can't imagine the girls are eating, what did I say, cabbage? Giblets. <laughs> Giblet. <laughs> Here, girls. Mm. Mm, giblet. <laughs> Giblicious. <laughs> oh, wow. So we've got... Um, uh, the girls enjoying and singing the praises of these of these piroshkis. I'm sorry, piroshki. That is the that piroshki. is the plural. Piroshki. That is the plural. <laughs> You're right. Thank you for correcting me. So Mrs. Garrett says, "Stay for dinner," and she's like, "Oh no, I couldn't. I got to get home to my husband. We're playing bridge or something. Gin. To, playing gin tonight." And then she says. Suddenly, Mrs. Garrett's like, the roads are getting icy. You shouldn't be driving. Stay well, I over. Think you, right. The idea is she wants to truly thwart Natalie's plans. Yeah. And she can see that Natalie doesn't want grandma there. So here you go, kid. Yeah. I'm going to make her be here. Yeah. Though, though I'm going to inconvenience an old woman in her 70s. <laughs> that's yeah. kind of weird. That's 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 the writing of the show you love mm-hmm. so dearly. Mm-hmm. That's very true. Her husband's name is Herman, for whatever that's worth. So. Glimshire. Uh, what? Herman Glimshire. Glimshire. <laughs> <laughs> that's a... If you're listening to this, you might be a fan. That's a... a Dick Van Dyke reference. Oh, That's is it a really? Dick Van Dyke show? Yes. Yeah. Herman Glimshire was was um, uh, Sally Rogers' uh, on again, off again boyfriend. Oh, was he? Oh, okay, cool. All right. Well, it ends up with the plan that she is going to stay, and very illogically, on a couple of occasions, they've had people staying over, and it's like never addressed. Where do people stay when they stay over? But they addressed it here. But they addressed it here. Mrs. Garrett says, Natalie and Mona, you are going to stay in my room, Mm -hmm. and I'm going to go bunk with the girls. And hers looks like a normal bedroom, and they they have a fold-out bed as well. They brought in a fold-out bed, thank goodness. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Seemed to make good sense. mm Mm-hmm. So before they go, 
Uh, before we move on to this next scene, Mona does have to make the phone call to Herman to tell him that she's not going to be coming home and playing gin tonight. On an old 1980s giant metal payphone on the wall. <laughs> Steve, what, did, what sound did you make? You made a funny... Did I gasp at you, the payphone? You, you just kind of went, oh. You, you made some type of an audible, <laughs> like, like, holy shit, look at that. Because it's, 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 it's bigger than ancient her. Ancient technology now. Yeah. The, 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 the stuff fo- we grew up with. And she's so tiny, she's like reaching up to it to put the coins in. So after she makes the phone call, um, we go up into the bedroom. Now, this is where we get a little bit of the guilt trip grandma situation. Where Mrs. Garrett comes in to check. Oh, first of all, she's singing. She's... Yeah, she's got this little song that she keeps singing that Natalie keeps dismissing. And you just know it's being telegraphed from so far out yeah. that this song is going to mean something at some point. There's a payoff coming. But it's just added to the list of annoyances in addition to her weekend plans being thwarted. Um, so b- 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 before we go on, this is the point where Mrs. Garrett says, if you girls don't mind me bunking with you. And I'm like, I thought they were going skiing. Right. I what thought, happened? They were all dressed for it. it. Why Why did Natalie have a suitcase actually packed and zipped and needed bringing down by Mrs. Garrett for this two-day weekend, which Blair clearly says, why don't you come skiing with us instead of what you're doing? Like, mm-hmm. it is an either-or. So, <sighs> script writers, let's, let's do a little bit better, okay? Please, thank you. We have... The okay, 35 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> Got to get in our time machine <laughs> and give them our notes. Mm-hmm. That's what we're going to do. Um, so when Mrs. Garrett comes in to check, she's like, how do you like, is everything okay? Are you comfortable? And Mona says, oh, the bed is lovely. I mean, some people like it soft. <laughs> yes. So Mrs. Garrett is like, you mean you need it harder? I could go get a bed board for you. And she's like, oh, no, don't bother. And Natalie says, Mrs. Garrett, when she says don't bother, bother. bother right. And that's very, once again, very Jewish mother. Very, very Jewish, Jewish grandmother. Very, very but, Jewish. Uh, right. Yeah, don't, I'll, I'll just, what's, uh, how many Jewish mothers does it take to change a light bulb? Yes. None. I'll just sit in the dark. I'll just sit in the dark. <laughs> I, oh, I remember my friend Lisa's mother would say, no, no, you eat. I'll have less. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, I uh, what do I do now? I yeah, really exactly. honestly don't know I what know. I'm supposed to do. Now, you know, do I eat? Yeah. Like, ah. Oh, no, I <laughs> ate yesterday. I ate yesterday. Oh, no, go fine. ahead, you eat. I'll have yeah. less. <laughs> oh. So they nailed that. So, yes. So they, they got that right there. Um, so Natalie and Mrs. Garrett go out to get the, the bed board. No sooner do they return... And they come in the room and she's nowhere to be seen. And it's like, where is she? <gasps> oh my God, she's on the floor. Mrs. Garrett and Charlotte Ray trying to play drama. Mm-hmm. Oh my God! <laughs> trying to do her. Uh, she's a couple of oh my gods in this. And it's like, ooh. It's. Uh, oh but God, Grandma's it's... okay. She's just on the floor doing leg lips. Yeah, I'm just doing my leg lips. It help with the, helps with the circulation. Wasn't that hilarious? Telling. We <laughs> misdirected an old lady having a stroke. <laughs> That's comedy. <laughs> So there is talk of, did I ever tell you about this? And Natalie's like, yes, Grandma, you're always telling me something. You're always doing Like, Natalie's um, particularly annoyed because she's trying to apparently compose on a piece of paper what she is going to say when she makes the phone call to Chip Douglas to tell him she cannot meet him now on this date, which is taking place we now. Don't- Exactly. As far as we know, exactly. What the the, the fuck? timeline is all over the place. It's it's crazy, and um and the grandmother does say, ah, you know, I never seen so much trouble being made over talking to a boy. Uh, there's always another boy, and Natalie's like, well, maybe I don't want there to be another boy, and shut the fuck up, you old bitch. I'm yeah. pa- I'm paraphrasing. You were quite a bit. Yeah. The grandmother goes to pinch Natalie on the cheek, and she tries to give her a kiss. Oh. Explain to me. She says, all right, well, I'm tired. And she pinches her cheek. Mm-hmm. And then she does this kind of a a, a kiss and then a throw. Like, yes. Like she Natalie throws. clearly doesn't want to be touched. So then just when it's time to kiss her goodnight, she leans in and realizes, oh, gee, I can't do that. So she kisses her hand and like throws it at her. her throw, like, but it, it was a really lovely piece of physical business that got a nice round of applause from oh, the yeah. audience. Um, because Molly Pecan's an all pro. She fucking rocks I mean, it. Is, She's great is, in this yes. episode. The material is thin, but she is. Just, uh, she handles it just beautifully. Absolutely. So, um, 
Finally, Natalie says, you've ruined my weekend. Like she turns out the light. Natalie doesn't want the light off because she's still writing her thing. Why would you turn the light off? And then she finally says, um, uh, ruined weekend. Oh, you've ruined my weekend. And then, oh, it comes out that Natalie was deceiving the thing about when their shoe was going to be. And so Molly, uh, I keep on Molly, Mona. Mona says something about... You can lie to a mother, but you do not lie to a grandmother. <laughs> right. Like, it's, yeah, the lying to your parents was forgivable, but not to me. Yeah. <laughs> and she exactly. kind of she kind of storms out and, and goes downstairs. And she's like, uh, she ends up saying, uh, what? No, I'm going to leave. You hate me, clearly. Mm-hmm. And she says, Grandma, I don't hate you. She says, all right, you love me. You just hate being with me. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go. Where are you going to go? Don't bother. And she walks out. End of act. Uh, fade to black, and we go to commercial. Mm-hmm. And uh, for legs, <laughs> is that your <laughs> is that your favorite commercial? I, I don't know. From a drug guard, be 1981. It's, uh, it's legs, uh, pantyhose. pantyhose, and an egg. I often <laughs> ask my guests to name a commercial from the era. You you did this without my asking. Oh well, you're, there you go. You're psychotic. Wow. <laughs> uh-huh, well, during uh-huh. the uh, commercial portion of the episode, this is when I like to do a little getting to know you with my guest. And uh, kind of fragrance that's here to stay, and they call it Charlie. <laughs> there it is. That's another one. I'll post. I will be posting those to the website. Um, so, Steve, I kind of do a little bit of a James Liptony thing here, as far as in our day-to-day uh, theme park lives, our characters they they don't cross paths very often. They they didn't back when we were around a lot, and Correct. they do so even less now. You do, you, and, do you have some kind of questionnaire for me? Is this what we're leading to? Where well, it's like the James Lipton. Just uh, where were you born? Oh, really? Yeah, I was born in the Bronx. Okay, you're a New Yorker. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Never really lived there. My parents, who were Bronx Jews, had just moved to a garden apartment in New Jersey, I guess, in anticipation of their second child, who was me. Oh. But my, but it was, you know, I mean, right across the George Washington Bridge, and all my mom's doctors were still in the Bronx and whatever. And so I was born in the Bronx okay. uh, uh, to her Bronx doctors and then brought home across the bridge to New Jersey. Okay. And New Jersey is home where you grew up, where yeah. you feel uh-huh. is that. Okay. And then um, where did you study as far as did you did you do uh, any sort of secondary education after uh i did I, I did a, a year at glassboro state college in south jersey and transferred up to rutgers uh i didn't have any support as far as for me to pursue the arts quite the opposite i was mm-hmm. deeply dissuaded and oh. was pretty much told that nobody's going to pay a penny of my college education if i'm doing uh, theater and whatever it's too bad because uh, Right when I was at Rutgers, if I had gone into the Mason Gross School of Arts and done a theater program there, I would have been with James Gandolfini. We're the exact same age, and and oh. uh, and I'm sure we would have been great pals. Yeah, um, yeah. I, you could I, have been the Jewish James Gandolfini. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you should go. bill yourself as that when you go back to stand up. Soprano <laughs> Um <laughs> Uh, so no, I never finished college. Okay, because I think did... I was in huge denial of what I what I wanted to do, and I was uh, just pursuing things I had no interest in. Okay, so and... did but so did you like do any theater studies at all in the course of that, or you didn't even get near it? No, of... I didn't get near it. Wow. Um, then so where did the changeover happen? An old uh, uh, my old high school drama teacher, mm-hmm. who was a major improv guy, mm-hmm. at one point decided I'm putting together an improv group with some of my favorite old students and the people that really had a. Wow. A, a good handle on this. And, and um, that's how my uh, company, Unexpected Company, was born. And we started working in the clubs around New Jersey and then in Manhattan. Um, then we started casting beyond our friends as, you know, the, yeah. the people who, who just weren't serious about it, stopped playing at it. And we got, and I started working with some people that you know in Unexpected Company, Mary Thompson Hunt, Mark Lehner. Um, and then uh, eventually, um, uh, just th- through people we knew in the improv uh, circuits, one of them was. Uh, Chris Oyen, who was uh, kind of an improv god in Manhattan at the time and started working for Walt Disney World. And as he had needs at Pleasure Island, he brought some people down that he liked and thought could do a good job for him. And he brought Mark Lehner down and Mary Thompson yeah. down and me down. And that was all for the very, very well-known, well-respected, and sadly missed Comedy Warehouse. Yeah. At Pleasure Comedy Island. Warehouse at Pleasure Island, mm-hmm. which was, how many shows did you guys do a night? Uh, there were five a night. Five? So 25 a week, but it, we would be, you know, we, at my time, it was generally, you would do either 17 or 18 a week, depending on your 
yeah. on your schedule. Okay. So that's a lot of darn shows that's a week. a lot of damn improv. Yeah. It, where improv is your full-time job. You have a 40-hour week yeah. job, and all you did was improv. and Made a living at it. I was very fortunate, too, because I think I was there kind of at the exact right time, 91 to 99, oh, yeah. which was the the... You know, it was still coming up when I first started Pleasure Island, and it reached this height, this fever pitch, where, I mean, you couldn't walk down the street on a Saturday night. There were lines to get in every club. Oh, yeah, it was insane. Yeah. It was huge. It was yeah. a scene. Yeah. You know, to be there for a scene. I love when that happens. You know, I imagine, and everything lasts a little bit, you know. Yeah. Kate Ashbury was a scene for a few years. Yeah. S- Studio 54, you know. Yeah, things, yeah. Things, and then they're not. And, then, and that's kind of what happened. But luckily, I was gone from Pleasure Island before it became the knot. Yeah. I think I just timed it really well. That's always a good thing mm-hmm. when you when you can look back and say I got out just in time. So after the comedy warehouse kind of being the big, you know, initial meat and potatoes thing that brought you to Orlando yeah. and all that, uh, let us let us sidebar for a second. You also have done actual stand-up comedy. Not much. No. No, surprisingly little. Okay. Because working with you and being your friend, yeah. And spending time with you is very much like being with a stand-up comic Uh from, uh, I'd say, the Catskills, somewhere between like 58 and 62. I have a joke writer's mind. You do? There you go. Bingo. When we did Laughter on the 23rd Floor at Mad Cow Theater... I had you... to play an old Jew in a New York writer's room. <laughs> yeah, what a stretch. Yeah. Get me an ace bandage. Yeah. <laughs> and, but the thing was, all the rest of us were, it was, you know, it was like, <laughs> we were supposed to be a room full of Jewish writers and all of us. It was me and Tim Williams and Heather Leonardi and... Brandon Roberts. Brandon Roberts, Glenn Gover. Uh, and Philip Nolan. Philip Nolan and uh, Connor, oh, Connor Marsico. Connor Marsico. Uh, the secretary was Robin Kelly. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, did I my get God, it, right? it was the tiniest little role. And she rang more God. laughs out of that than I imagine anyone who's ever done it on Broadway could have ever found. Robin oh. Kelly is magic. I just, yes. I cannot wait to have her on the show. It's going to happen uh, someday. But having you there was so important you gave you legitimized us i was the authenticity you were the authenticity but not just for your presence the fact that you kind of helped us get the vibe you backstage is what this play is about you steve interacting with you steve pernick backstage Mm -hmm. where you're always looking for a joke or Mm -hmm. trying to make a pun when someone says something when they walk by you that's what that play is the play is a writer's room yeah and so you being there was, I think, so helpful to all of us and helpful to the production. And the production came out, I think, I still think it's one of the best things Mad Cow ever did. Uh-huh. But I might be biased. Yay. So among other things you've done, you've uh, moved on. You have been good friends with the uh, uh, Indiana Jones uh, director at the Indiana Jones? Yeah, I was a de- AD at in, in Indiana Jones for a year. That was right before I came to, to Citizens Street Hall and, 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 right, and, and was a, a Hollywood Public Works. Yes, and uh, who, was, who was the character with whom you were very close friends? What, Buddy Flowers? Buddy Flowers. Buddy Flowers. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I say that in the past tense. That, yeah. I just mean, duh, you yeah. still are. Yeah, you might, you might still see Buddy Flowers. Yeah, out Buddy on the Flowers. Street every now and then. Exactly. I sub over there, and, and uh, I used to do Mulch, Sweat, and Shears. I do the Pirates and Pals. Fireworks Voyage, a lot of stuff at, at Disney over the years. What am, what am I forgetting? Um, good. To, I, I don't know. I'll think yeah. Good. And, and uh, you just recently uh, rehearsed into the horror makeup show and, at Universal. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful show. Oh, and I can't wait to honor, do it with you. It's an honor to be a part of that cast. There's a lot of really, really great people. You do it too. And thank you. Thank you. There you go. That was, my, <laughs> that was a... <laughs> Oh, <laughs> yes. I cannot wait. I love Horror Makeup Show is, I've said it a million times, it is a great script. It starts out on paper as brilliant, and then we get the ability to make it even better, and it is so much fun. And every single body at that stage is awesome. I am, like you, I feel very honored I get to work with these people. Okay. So I can't wait. All right. Is there anything else you need to know about my career? Uh, blood type? <laughs> I have no idea. Sperm count? Red. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sperm count? Uh, hold on. Let me get some. Uh, oh, oh, wow. Oh, man. That's oh, man. That's going to stain. Yes. Y- yes. And uh, you that's know, it. You know the sperm banks will pay you for, uh, I think, all the money I let slip through my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> 
That is Steve Pernick, ladies and gentlemen. You get that all the time. <laughs> Can I, I don't know if this will end up in the show or probably in the extras. I, I still, I have quoted this so many times. My favorite, favorite Steve moment. I was talking to someone who was running through different ailments that his his poor wife had gone through. His wife had had some health problems. And among the things he was listing, he said, well, she had gone through this, she did this treatment, and then she had a cataract. And as though on cue, as though you were waiting, you walked past the doorway, just turned your head to us and went, really? I drive a Rinkin. And kept on walking. It was just- She had a cataract. Really? I drive a Rinkin. (laughs) And I'm like- were you waiting? <laughs> Had you been waiting your entire life around that corner hoping uh, someone might say the word cataract? No, you just you have your file. You know what I mean? If you can access your files fast enough. That's what it is. It's just about. Not, that's, it's not great. It's just speedy. Yeah, I, I hear you. That's so much of what what improv is about and what our what our jobs are about. And may, may we, we always... love uh, Robin Williams is for the, the quickness of the mind. Oh, God. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there's something to be said for a quick mind. Yes, indeed. Well, of the many jobs uh, that you juggle, as so many who have sat there before you, I always say thank you for making the time because I know juggling all this stuff is is crazy. So I'm really happy you got to do this, and uh, thank you for being here. And uh, now we're going to move on to Act Two. Why are Act you looking confused? Two. No, it's wonderful. We're talking. You're, you're like, what would I would rather do <laughs> with a night off than than <laughs> talk. Facts of Life Season 3. Um, from your mouth to God's ears. You were, you were looking around kind of like, why are you thanking me for being here? It's like, yes, I, I do still thank you. So we come back now from the commercial. And we are in the kitchen. Mona is making herself some more hot water with lemon. Is that a Jewish beverage, Steve? Hot water with lemon? Hot water with lemon. Well, it's sure cheap. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Oh, I did not set that there up. There you go. Intentionally. But there it is. Did you hear about the Jewish cheerleader? No. Get that quarterback. <laughs> Jewish, Jewish girl says, Dad, I need to borrow $50. He says, $40? What do you need $30 for? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start talking. <laughs> <laughs> Steve is not performing now. This is this is what hanging out with him is like. Yeah, it's pretty much it's pretty true. So yes, yeah, she's having water with lemon. Um, because I guess that's an old grandma thing. It's, it's a know? grandma thing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so Mrs. and Gar- Mrs. Garrett is worried. How come you're not getting along with Natalie? Uh, we get a Mrs. Garrett. <laughs> And uh, and like many, they they are not too far off from Paul Lind, are they? <laughs> no, I they're really not. not. No. Um, so Mrs. Garrett comes down and she's like, "What are you doing down here? What's going on?" Yeah. And um, and she says, uh, "Oh, Natalie is mad at me. She says I treat her like a baby." And she does. It's kind of cute. She does defend herself and she says, "It's not like I plan to pinch her cheek. I just look at her and I have to do it." Yeah. And that's a grandmother, and it's like, that's kind of sweet. And, yeah. Um, Mrs. Garrett says she can commiserate because she wants to pinch her kids' cheeks, too. And, unfortunately, her son is pushing 32. Right. Um, And then she mentions grandchildren. And then she mentions grandchildren, and Mrs. Garrett says, yes, I don't have any grandchildren. I have two sons. One of them is single. One of them is lazy. Right. And I don't know the show, so there was no payoff for that for me whatsoever, and it doesn't ever get alluded to again. No. But I mean, it's just—I it, think it's just funny to say one of my sons could give me grandchildren, but he's, but he's lazy, too lazy to too get la- too lazy stooped. to fuck. Yeah, uh, he, he's, wow, you, you just, you're you, just going for the language on this you can, one, aren't you? You can. This is adult content. Did okay. you not know? I did I not tell you you could. I work Disney clean. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you don't want to hear what we say backstage. <laughs> um, so. Um, now, going into the Facts of Life Cinematic Universe, or the FOLCU, as I call it, we do know Mrs. Garrett has two sons. We met one of them who was uh, a musician on the road, and he was kind of a, a, a drifter. And Is he not, the single or the lazy? He'd be the single one. Okay. Because we only met him less than a year ago. So the lazy one has got to be her other son, which is Raymond. 
Raymond, in a couple of years, is going to buy a building and give it to her so she can open up her own bakery. Well, he got over his laziness then, didn't he? Then, as they're talking... Oh, so then they come out into the cafeteria. And Mona says, oh, You know, I have this friend, Rose Ferrillo. And then she says, It's a friend of mine up there, pointing to the ceiling. And Mrs. Garrett's like, Oh, I'm so sorry. And she says, No, no, she's in the apartment upstairs. Yeah. 12B. Hilarious. Ba-boom. There it is. Um, uh, old people, she says that young people think that old people should have an open purse and a closed mouth. And Mrs. Garrett says, speaking of obscene language that the censors probably had to, had to have a word with them about, Mrs. Garrett says, bull feathers! Bull feathers. Whoa, Edna, damn. She says, there's nothing the young girls haven't gone through that we haven't been through. Or at least haven't heard about on Donahue. Nice reference to the Phil Donahue program. Very popular. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, right. It, you you would have to watch this like on pop-up video or something like that with footnotes. You know yeah. what I mean? Because anybody coming up now would have no idea what, what, what a Phil Donahue even is. Sure. Yeah. And that's what this podcast is. This is like a pop-up video without the video and, and the pop-ups. Yeah. Moving on, um, Blair and Natalie, no, I'm sorry, Blair and Tootie come downstairs. I don't know what was going on with the hairdo, with the hairstyle party that was happening in the room upstairs, but Blair is in a bathrobe and has a scarf over her head. Yes, or as grandma's about to call it, a babushka. Babushka. We have never, ever seen Blair wear her that in her hair before. We've never seen it again. There's no, like, rollers in her hair. There's no something that she would be concealing other than completely for the purpose of the upcoming story. Right. And um, what happens is Mona says, look at you. You are so beautiful. And she's like, oh, thank you. And she says, you look just like me. And Blair's like, huh? Huh? And in this cameo, this very large, very long, dangly cameo, is that what it's called? Yeah, it, we're not talking about a, a, a small role on the show, not that kind of cameo. We're actually talking about one <laughs> worn around the neck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Because Molly Picon's making a lovely cameo on this. Yeah, side she's making a lovely <laughs> a walk on, at least. It's, it's very large. And again, Molly's not a very large woman. She's very diminutive, but... She has this long thing, and it looks, it's like, wow, that's, and then to learn that in, in the cameo is a picture of herself from when she was 16. Correct. You wear that around your neck when you go to bed? Really? Vain. Um, so she pulls out the cameo with the picture of her when she was 16, the photograph taken in the Ukraine of her wearing her babushka. We never see it, but everybody oohs and ahs around it, and oh, you are beautiful, and oh, you did look like Blair, and, and, and Blair, you did look like this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then she says, this photo was taken in the war. And they were like, the war? Yeah. You were there for the war? And she says something along the lines of, they say, what was it like? And she says, uh, uh, there's an old saying, war stories are not bedtime stories. And then I forget if she actually starts at that point. But uh, Natalie and Joe, Natalie is back up in the bedroom. We go back up to Mrs. Garrett's bedroom where Natalie is still working on this letter yeah. on how she's going to tell this boy, sorry, can't make it. It's before word processors. You couldn't just cut and paste. Uh, she could have she could have gone to her home computer, which would have been the size of a garage. Yes. And then Joe comes in, and wow. Hey, computers go all the way back to biblical times. Do they? Yes. Eve had an apple, and Adam had a wang. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Tip your service, try the veal. Uh, Natalie is then, Joe pops her head into the room. And this scene is short and escalates very quickly. Very quickly. Where it's like... Um, Where's your grand? Oh, where's your grandmother? Oh, she's downstairs because I got mad at her. Why would you do that? You're lucky you got a grandmother. Blah blah blah. And then the, and they very quickly, Joe and Natalie are kind of barking at each other, and then it culminates in Joe saying, "You know, I wish I had grandparents." And she says, "All they want to do is love you." Yeah, and they the, don't ask anything of you. All yeah, all they want to do is love you. And it gets a, on a kind of an applause. And, and a big applause. Like, yeah. they're like, yeah, fuck you, Natalie. You're being a lying bitch. <laughs> that, yes, that was... I'm, I'm paraphrasing. The again. implication of the applause yes. was, fuck you, Natalie. <laughs> 
So then we come back to, in the cafeteria, we're now technically in the final scene of the show, and uh, Mona is telling about the Bolsheviks invading their village, I guess. Is, yeah. Uh-huh. She and, uses the term Bolshevik. She also uses the word Cossacks at some point. So this probably would have been the pogroms just pre- World um, War II. No. No. This, I mean, the what she's describing sounds czarist, sounds pre-Russian Revolution. Um, so once guess, again, it's a timeline thing. You, you're, we struggle with timeline all the way through this. Why not do it here too? Um, but, you're right. You're t- but no, as you're saying this, I'm like, duh, you're but, right. But, but the description of it is very uh, uh, pre-Russian Revolution, So, which was, what, 1917. So if this is around 1916 and yeah. we're dealing with 81, how many years is that? I can't quite do the math. Well, let's put it this way. 55? This is This is 81. Yeah. And she's supposed to be, I think, in her. Years. She's supposed to be in her late seventies now. Right. So, so let's just so round. This was sixty-five years. If she's in her late seventies, then 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 she would have been. Um, so she would have been about yeah about fourteen. Yeah. So that's probably pretty close. Yeah. No, yeah. you're totally right. Because what what my brain did was I thought let's round her up and say she's eighty-one years old yeah. in 1981. Right. Well, she would have been sixteen in 1916. Yeah. And yeah. that's that ain't World War Two. That's yeah. World War. That's well, Russian yeah. Revolution. That's yeah. the first, the the Great War, as they call it. So thank you for correcting me. You're but, duh. I should have known that. So then she tells the story of one of this one mean Cossack was whipping her father, yeah. and she ran up to him and said, "Stop that!" And then he uh, held a gun to her chest and said, "Lie down." And she said, "If you're going to kill me, I'm going to stand." And then. Some? He said, yeah, and then he said, I, oh, no, I, I don't, I'm not going to kill you. I want something else. Oh, you're right. That's right. And that's where we get the that's second. That's why he told her to lie down. That's he right. wanted something else. You're, you're totally right. I, and then that's where we get the second Mrs. Garrett. Oh, my God. <laughs> the beautiful. I yeah, mean, and the girls are freaking out. They're hanging on every word. What'd you do? What'd you do? And she, yeah. said, she said, well, I don't know where I got the, the strength, but I pushed this guy over. He fell over a stool, and I ran, and I ran, and I ran until I got to a cornfield, and I hid in the cornfield. And they never found her. Yeah, and and Natalie has entered, and, and is hearing the story of her grandma she's never heard before. Yeah, and suddenly she's taken in too, and she's like, "Man, mm-hmm. why didn't you ever tell me this stuff? You don't tell it to a child." She yeah, says. that's and true. She, she said, "But grandma, I'm not a child anymore. How old were you when this happened?" And she tells her, "I was 15." She says, "I'm 15." Yeah, they start and... bonding now. They do. And then the payoff that you were looking for, you even said it. Where's the yeah. song? Yeah, you where's said, the song? Okay, we're getting there. Oh, we're getting yeah. the bubble. Where is the song? We got the song. She's like, I think she says, I think she goes, I want to have another cup of tea with lemon. Yeah. She goes back over to the kettle. Singing her song. Singing her song. And where does that song from? Is it something special? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like she's sitting here, yeah. Steve. And... Um, uh, she says, "Oh, that was a song that um, that my my boyfriend. She doesn't say boyfriend. What does she say? Sweetheart, I think. Yeah, that's it. That was a song that my sweetheart used to sing for me. And she does a um, translation. She, a translation. So she hums it. I'm I'm surprised she didn't sing it in Yiddish. Yeah. And then translate it. She just hums the melody and then says and says the words. English English translation language. Yeah." And it's basically, you know, I will wait for you on this bridge forever, and it's it's a it's lovely and romantic and all declaration the girls, of eternal, never ending love. And all the and and Natalie says, "Oh my God, that was Grandpa." And she said, "No, this was before Grandpa. Yeah, this was he. This was he became a my first love became a soldier and went off in the war, and I didn't see him again. I came to America, and then I met your grandfather. Yeah. So remember when I was telling you, there's always going to be another boy. I wasn't telling you because I didn't know. Yeah. I was telling you because I do know. Nice. Right? That's And then they're, they're bonding. Yeah. And the sort of final uh, thing to to build this, this beautiful experience up is Natalie. That's when Natalie says, well, how old were you? Mm-hmm. And she says, well, I was already a grown-up then. I was already a woman. I was, already, I was already a woman. Right. I was 15. Right. And Natalie's like... I'm 15, meaning, so why the fuck are you pinching right. my cheeks still? So <clears throat> ultimately they come to this beautiful understanding. Yeah. And, and, and Where they have to both meet in the middle. It's right. not one is right and one is wrong, but Natalie is more wrong. And, and <laughs> Right. And Grandma in her wisdom says, you know what? Let's call it truce. I will st- stop treating you like an infant 
if you stop treating me like an antique. To the applause of the audience, uh, everyone rejoices. Fences have been mended. Yeah. And uh, what bridges, new understandings we have of one another. Bridges have been built between generations. Gaps are now no longer gappy. And uh, yeah, so I think, I think this episode uh, changed the world a little bit, don't you? No. <laughs> no. No. So... As uh, much as this podcast will. Oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> That's so sweet. Well, this has just flown by. I'm, I'm kind of like, oh, are we already at the end of the episode? I could sit here and have you throw out more jokes at me for nice. a much uh, longer period of time. Now, I understand that Mrs. Garrett, Uh huh. you were talking about the spinoff of Tootie's parent, parents or yes, aunt or whatever. Aunt, yeah. But this was a spinoff itself, right? Yes, it was. From, different strokes. From different strokes. Yeah. Yes. Did you ever watch Different Strokes? I know, not much. Same story. I was, I was very, I yeah. was completely aware of all the characters and the you knew and what the you situation. talked about Willis. Yes, mm-hmm. but uh, I remember uh, uh, several years ago, um, Dano Sullivan. Did you know Dano? He was a sack theater guy. Yeah, I, did I remember not, he no. told me he said um, Conrad Bain died from yeah. Different Strokes. Yeah, and I said, really? I thought it was a heart attack. Um, (laughs) on that note (laughs) I can't think of a better way to end the show Steve Steve Pernick thank you so much for doing this thank you for all the fun and all the laughs here and beyond in all of your career and I hope you'll be able to come back maybe what a joy bye to all four of you bye (laughs) and there you have it that was Steve Pernick Now do you understand why saying funny man Steve Pernick just doesn't really scratch the surface of (laughs) the insane comedy mind this man has. Uh, I'm so glad he came on the show and I'm so glad that he was willing to be a part of this particular episode and give his own uh, bent on it as a Jewish person. So I really, really thank him for that. Uh, just some follow-up to stuff we mentioned on the show. First of all, the head writer for The Carol Burnett Show was Saul Turtletaub. That was the particularly Jewish name I couldn't think about and I couldn't remember, and there it is. Um, the other thing is that uh, Tootie's grandparents talking about the good old days. I just wanted to be 100% sure that Steve and I were not being really total freaking assholes going on our little fun riff And I texted Trinell Mooring, you may recall her, from uh, an earlier episode. I believe it was Molly's Holiday that she did. But Trinell is my African-American friend. And she did respond to my question, do African-Americans refer to or reminisce about the good old days? And her response was, LOL, that was written by white people. (laughs) And I thought, okay, good. We, we were right. We, my point of view, our perspective was, was uh, on the mark, on the target. That was a good thing. And actually, Trinell went on to say, anytime she's sitting around talking to her friends, her contemporaries, and someone will mention something along the lines of, wouldn't it be cool to go back to this other period of time and experience this thing? Trinell said, she even goes, no, nuh-uh, not going to do it. Do not want to go back to any earlier time. So another thing is uh, Mrs. Garrett referring to her kids and saying that one of them is single and one of them is lazy. The lazy one she is referring to is Raymond, because I looked ahead in season five, episode 24. That's the one where Raymond and his wife are having troubles. And there is a concern that it will somehow affect the building and the ownership of Edna's edibles. And in the course of trying to get them to reconcile the last word on them getting back together. Mrs. Garrett says, All I want is grandchildren. And when Raymond kind of rebuffs her, Raymond, who is an accountant, by the way, she responds to him, Don't worry, they're deductible. So there it is. We are sticking to canon here in the Facts of Life Cinematic Universe. We are correct. Raymond does not have kids. I was not 100% sure of that. And uh, my final note, getting back to Steve Pernick, uh, a joke I meant to bring back, a great moment that he made me laugh so f- 
fucking hard. I think it was after a rehearsal for Laughter in the 23rd Floor. And the big thing on the internet that was making the rounds again was that, here is your drag queen name. It was like your first female pet and your mother's maiden name. And uh, I threw that out there. And Steve was like, I have no, what are you talking about? I said, your drag queen name. And Steve said, I don't think about that stuff. I'm straight. And then half a second went by and he turned and he said, hey, if I were a drag queen, my name would be Dick Tucker. Thank you. He's here all week. Tip your servers. Try the veal. Next week, I'm going to be watching Season 3, Episode 9. It's called Dear Me. And my special guest is going to be funny lady, super amazing actress, Lisa wolf Pankal. Cannot wait. Thank you so much for listening to this week's show. And remember, the facts of life are all about you. Let's Face the Facts was produced, written, hosted, and edited by me, David Almeida. My theme song was beautifully arranged and recorded by Ned Wilkinson. Our website is facethefactspod.com. You have to drop the let's. And that's where you can find extra pictures, video, and audio extras from the digital cutting room floor. Follow the show on social media. We're everywhere under the handle Face the Facts Pod. And don't forget, go to your favorite podcatchers and subscribe, rate, and review. Tune in again next week for another thrilling episode of Let's Face the Facts.